What is the real prophetic difference between Passover and Pentecost? And what is this counting of the Omer in between anyway? In this teaching, we're going to discuss how the unleavened bread of Passover is connected to the leavened bread of Shavuot and how all of that is connected to the first and second comings of the Messiah and our lives today. So as we are in the middle of the incredible season of Passover, which is the beginning of the religious calendar, on God's calendar, I should say, we are entered into an amazing time. This is not only the time of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, or Yeshua in the Hebrew, but it is the counting down to the 50 days until Pentecost, or Shavuot, as it's called in the original tongue. And so what I'm going to discuss in this teaching is make a connection between Passover and Pentecost, how it relates to the first and second comings of Messiah, how it relates to us today, how it relates to the life of a believer that starts with salvation and ends in spiritual maturity. So first and foremost, let's talk about Passover and the unleavened bread. Why is Passover talking about unleavened bread? Why is the entire feast of unleavened bread about unleavened bread? Well, if you go back to Exodus chapter 12, you discover the exact answer, and that's in verse 33 and 34, for those of you that are taking notes, where it says that the Israelites had to leave in haste. They had to leave very quickly after the 10th plague in order to get out of Dodge quick. They did not have time to put yeast or leaven in the dough, and so they had what we call flatbread, or in the original language, matzah unleavened bread. And so God, in his infinite wisdom, decided, you know what, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have an entire feast, seven days, starting with Passover, where it's only going to be unleavened bread. And of course, leaven in the scriptures represents sin for the most part. And uh, we're going to talk about the other side of the coin of what leaven can also be too, because it can be positive. But for the most part, leaven represents sin. And so getting the leaven or the sin out of our house is an annual a tradition or an annual commandment that allows us to remember what true covenant with God really is when it's unadulterated, unstained, and just flat out the way it's supposed to be. But I'm going to suggest that it has a different meaning in just a moment. So now let's fast forward 50 days and we move down the timeline all the way to Shavuot and we discover that Shavuot is all about loaves of bread where the priest would take two loaves of bread fully cooked, baked out, and wave them as a wave offering before the Lord along with the sacrificial offerings that went with it. This was a culmination of the Passover season that started 50 days earlier with Passover. And then, of course, you have unleavened bread in there, and you have Yom Bikarim, which is the first barley harvest, which is, of course, when Yeshua, Jesus, rose from the dead. And so this season of what we call Passover, this 50-some-odd-day season, ends with Pentecost. And, of course, this is when not only the commandments of God were given on Mount Sinai 1,400 years earlier, this is when the Holy Spirit was given uh, on the day of Pentecost to those that were in that upper room in Acts chapter 2. An amazing time for sure. To not understand the spring feast days of the Lord is to miss so much richness, it's not even funny. So what I want to do is I want to make this connection that we start out making bread in Passover and we end up finishing the bread in Shavuot. So I'm going to suggest that this entire season of Passover is all about making bread. Let's see if I'm right. In John chapter 6, verse 35 and 51, it says this, And Yeshua said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. In verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. What's incredible about this is Yeshua says that he is the bread of life. He's the manna from heaven. Remember that. He also says in, in Matthew chapter 5 that we are the salt and the light. So let me just read this for you. It says in verse 13 of chapter 5 of Matthew, you are the salt of the earth. 
but if the salt loses its flavor, how should it become seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And so right here, my friends, we have three incredible analogies that our Messiah is connecting both himself and us to. He says that he is the light of the world, but then he says we are the light of the world. He says he is the salt of the earth, but then we're the salt of the earth. He's the bread from heaven and, and the bread for, for men, and then we, by extension, become the bread. Because with, if we eat from him, then we become who he is, and we take on both his attributes, supposed to, and his mission, which is to feed the hungry spiritually and physically, okay? And so what I'm going to suggest to you today is that this uh, the idea of the bread is really glossed over quite a bit, I believe, in uh, all theological circles. And I want to really zoom in on this to, to explain what I believe the original intent, the purpose, and the point of what Yahweh is trying to teach. What God is trying to teach us through the spring feast days is how bread is made. How do you make bread? So let's take this a little bit further and, uh, and, and, and remind you that Every single Friday night at sundown, when every Messianic and every Jewish home and every Christian uh, that, that believes in the front of the book that celebrates the Sabbath, uh, celebrates it, we say this particular Hebrew blessing over the bread whenever we have communion or we celebrate the elements every Friday night with our families. And it goes like this, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamotzi lachem min haaretz. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the bread from the earth. So one of the main prayers in the Shabbat blessing, family blessing, is over the bread, thanking the Creator for the bread from the earth. So there is so much focus on the bread from the beginning of creation to the very end, Yeshua decides to call himself the bread. We pray over the bread and bless it and thank God for bringing it from the earth. So what is it about bread that he's trying to, to share with us? I believe the fact that the Passover bread is unleavened and the fact that the Shavuot bread is totally leavened gives us into the in mind of the Messiah, our creator, exactly what he's trying to do with us. I believe Passover, the unleavened bread of Passover, is connected through the journey of the counting of the Omer all the way to the power of Pentecost. And here's why. In Joshua chapter 5, we see this uh, crossing of the Jordan River. This is where the next generation, the Joshua Caleb generation, they cross into the land after 40 years of dealing with their complaining parents. They are the ones that are chosen by the Creator to walk into the promised land and to own it and to begin the process of taking back the land that was once theirs before they moved out and had to go to Egypt because of the drought during the time of Joseph. In verse 10, it says this, Now the children of Israel camped in the Gilgal, and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. And they ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that day year. I want to focus on a couple of things in this passage. First and foremost, I want to mention that it says that they ate the bread from the land for the very first time once they crossed over. This is incredible, my friends, because this is the gospel message. You are not allowed to eat of the bread of Yeshua, his body, until you make the decision in your mind I am going to cross over the Jordan into a new land, into my inheritance that is not even yours yet. You have to take it by force, but the Father gives you divine assistance. Once you, are, you, you cross the river, you immediately begin to eat from the land of your own inheritance. You're circumcised in the flesh, and then the giants begin to fall one at a time. The second thing I want to bring out, I think it's even more profound, is it says that the manna ceased on the day after they eat 
from the produce of the land. You see, they've been eating from the manna from heaven. And we focus, I think, a lot of times in, in uh, Christianity as uh, on the, the manna, that the manna is the most amazing thing. And who wouldn't want to have manna from heaven for crying out loud? But <laughs> literally, when the sun sets, God's original intent was not to give us manna from heaven. It was that we would grow in maturity and that we would cultivate the land ourselves and eat from the real bread of life. And so this is, again, it's part of our spiritual journey. The eating of the manna shows immaturity. The eating of the bread shows the growth of the spiritual individual. And the manna is like the milk of the word, and the bread is like the steak, okay, uh, and potatoes of the word. We're supposed to be mature believers. And so I want to focus on that. I want to focus on this word. I want to teach you a Hebrew word uh, for mature, uh, and it's called tamim. Tamim in Hebrew or I should say tamim in English, many times is rendered as perfect. In Genesis, I believe it's chapter 6, verse 9, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Noah, it says he was perfect in all generations. Now, we can look at that and we can look in English and, and deduce that he was a perfect, he was sinless. But in Hebrew, it does not mean perfect uh, like, like it does in English, uh, meaning uh, sinless, but mature and complete, not lacking anything. That's what tamim means. It means to be mature, complete, without blemish, full, perfect, without spot, whole, and undefiled. It means that he's a righteous man. Abraham was tamim. Isaac was tamim. Jacob was very not tamim for a very long time until he matured. King David had to walk through the process of being tamim. Tamim is the process that we go through that starts with unleavened bread, the beginning process of making bread. And as we mature through the counting of the Omer and we count the seven Shabbats, the seven Sabbaths, the 49 days, on the very next day, the bread is tamim. It's complete. It's had it the proper yeast added to it the proper kneading, the proper rising, the proper heat, the proper tribulation, and then out comes this incredible loaf of bread that's worthy for the high priest to wave before Yahweh himself. This is the spiritual journey that all of us are on, my friends. We are all on the journey of going from salvation, which is what I believe Passover is connected to. Of course, uh, uh, Yeshua dies on the cross and creates the opportunity for the veil to be rent and the Holy of Holies to be open, and for salvation to come to all men. But that is not where it's supposed to end. It's only the beginning. That is the beginning down payment, which I believe that's why Passover is connected to the first coming of the Messiah, while Shavuot, uh, the fullness of the bread, is connected to the second coming. Now, I'm not saying that Yeshua is going to come during Passover. I believe he's absolutely going to come during the fall feast, of Yom Terah, the Feast of Trumpets, or traditionally today called Rosh Hashanah. But that being set aside, I believe that you can see that you've got Yeshua as the unleavened bread. That's the down payment, but that's not all. That is not make a mature believer just believing in Jesus. Just inviting Yeshua into your heart does not make a person to me. So I would like to walk through the scriptures and find out what does. What does mature look like? We know that maturity in bread is a loaf of bread because that is exactly what the master baker, if you will, intended when he got all the ingredients together. And by the way, sometimes in our lives, the ingredients are not so good uh, from the perspective of us. If you look at each individual ingredient uh, that goes into bread, you would never want to eat them by themselves. It's very disgusting. But when you take all the ingredients and you put them together, and then you do the, you add the, the leavening agent and you put it in the rise and then you put it in the oven and the heat is added. That's what makes the beauty in the bread. In the same way, our lives are filled with all kinds of things that, that by themselves in the moment of, of uh, pain and suffering, uh, some of you have been molested by your father. Some of you have gone through uh, counseling because of the tremendous emotional and physical trauma that you've gone through in your life. If you look at those individual events, they're terrible. But when you put all of them together 
and you sprinkle the leaven, the mature, complete confidence of the Lord Yeshua into all of those ingredients and you spin them together and you put them a little bit of trial, put a little heat in there and put a little warmth of the arms of God himself. What comes out when it all is said and done is mature, complete, a loaf of bread, worthy to be held by the priest and waved before God. You see, Yahweh's not looking for perfection. He's not looking for people that have never had suffering or pain. He is looking for those that are willing to allow all the ingredients of life to come together and let him stir it. See, the enemy can add this ingredient. I'm going to add cayenne pepper. That's hot. I'm going to add this. I'm going to add that. And the father says, that's fine. Because when I add my salt, when I add my mixture, when I put it through my oven, what will come out is the most amazing bread that anyone's ever had worthy for my table. So don't worry, my friends, what the enemy has ever done to you because God can take what the enemy has meant for evil and turn it around for good. So let's talk about this. James chapter one, verse two and four says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, not lacking anything. Here it is. Here's that Hebrew concept of tamim. Trials and tribulations produce maturity, which allows us to not lack anything. You see, our goals, my, my friends, uh, are to our goal is to become mature in Christ. So let's look at the scriptures and find out what maturity looks like. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says this. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I know just as I'm known. And now abides faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. And so the Apostle Paul, he connects maturity to the level of love, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these three elements that create maturity is love. And so if someone does not operate in love in every component of their life, putting their neighbor first, I know it sounds simple, it sounds so churchese, but this is the fundamental foundation stone of Torah, is love. Whoever loves the most is the most tamim, is the most mature. This is one of the fundamental foundation stones of the wall of spiritual maturity. And why? Because it's the fundamental foundation stone of the cornerstone of our faith, Yeshua himself. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. It says this, but solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. You see milk, my friends, what it's saying by default is those that are on the milk of, of God's word uh, cannot discern the difference between pleasing God and not pleasing God, good versus evil. They simply don't know enough Bible to be able to go into a situation and know exactly what to do because of the principle the uh, uh, and the point and the original intent of the scriptures. They don't know enough of the original scriptures to bring the principle out for every single circumstance. So maturity is based on your knowledge of the word of God so that you can have the wisdom of Yahweh in every single situation and discern between good and evil. When you go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 15, I really like this set of scriptures. It says, And he himself gave some up to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to a tamim, a mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. My friends, 
Listen to this. This is a great definition of spiritual maturity. If your goal is to become spiritual maturity, become spiritually mature, then you need to take this into consideration because the author here says that when you're a child, okay, you're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, meaning that you don't know enough of the Bible to know when someone's trying to pull one over on you. It also says that when you are spiritually mature, you know how to speak the truth in love. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that come into the understanding of the front of the book, as I like to call it, they come into the understanding of Torah and its relevance to, for today and its value of the principles that, that are therein. And they try to tell the truth and they tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, but they forget that they are the salt of the earth. They forget that they are the bread and no one wants stale bread. People want love. If you don't know how to salt things with love and to speak the truth in love, then the Bible says that you're an immature believer in the milk of the word and you don't even have the right to share the truth until you can learn to speak it in love. That is the measure of someone who's spiritually mature and someone who's spiritually immature, according to Ephesians chapter 4. It also says that the fivefold uh, ministry gifts of uh, apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, those are given to help people become mature. So watching this video is helping you become mature because you're, you're entering into the covenant of the five-fold ministry where you're learning from a teacher. Sometimes we can't do everything on our own. God gives uh, these offices to the body to serve the body, to help the body grow. Let's move on. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5 says, But also for this very reason, giving all dilig a diligence, add to your faith virtue to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. My friends, I could spend an entire hour on just this set of passages because we want to talk about all the details of how to do this and how to do that and how to keep Passover and how to count the Omer, but we forget the weightier measures, the weightier things that are on the scale, on God's scale, is right here. He says to all your, first thing he says, uh, for all this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, character, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Do you notice how in 1 Corinthians 13 and 2 Peter and Ephesians, we're all talking about one fundamental characteristic that ends every sentence, and it's love. If you do not have love, for the brethren, you do not know Christ because Christ loved the brethren so much so he laid down his own life. They didn't take it. He said he willingly laid it down. He willingly laid it down. When was the last time you willingly laid down your life, laid down an argument, laid down the right to be right and was okay with being wrong with a smile because it made the situation right? You see, my friends, I believe that the pride of man is the leaven in our life that we're supposed to get out. Because once you humble yourself and you empty yourself of the pride of always having to do things your way, always having to be right, always having to tell people that they're wrong about their theology or this and that and the other, whatever your issue is with pride, when we lay it down and we allow the Father to suck it out of us, then we end up being flat bread. We end up running out of Egypt prophetically, and we become the unleavened bread that he's looking for. Then what happens as time goes on, and we're counting the omer, and the omer is simply a measure, okay, of the wheat that gets cut at Shavuot that, that is the main ingredient for the bread that's made. That when we go through that long process of patience, Counting the blessings. That's what the counting of the Omer is all about. It's counting the blessings that you have already 
and then preparing to make an offering to God for a request on Shavuot. It's that moment of preparation of the soul that you are emptying yourself of your pride and simultaneously the Holy Spirit is adding in His leaven. And it's that leaven which is the maturity, it's the ingredients, aka the image characteristics of Christ. And when that gets added to a person's life, no longer is it I who live, but Christ in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So what happens is I no longer have pride or confidence in myself. The leaven that grows me from the inside creates a confidence in him a confidence in His Word, a confidence in His mission, His his point, His purpose, His original intent. You see, my friends, the prophecies only come true for your life when we empty ourselves of ourselves in the process between Passover and Pentecost. between Passover, which which is connected to salvation, and Pentecost, which is connected to a mature believer, what we discover is the journey of emptying ourselves and bringing an offering before our King. You see, it's all too easy for us to thank God for all of that He's given us, to pray before every meal, to before we go to bed, to thank him for our spouse, our children, our loved ones, or your job, your home, whatever he's given you. But where do we go from there? Because it's not just about thanking him verbally. It's not just about emptying yourself out in humility and allowing the mature ingredients of the characters of Christ that's founded on love to be found on your lips, in your mind, and on your hand. The Shema hear and obey. It's about bringing something to him, a sacrifice of praise that will will resonate before the throne of God. In the next teaching, I'm going to go into far more detail uh, than what I'm saying right now. But when everything is finished on this topic, here's what I want you to learn. I want you to see the beauty from Passover and the unleavened bread of what Yeshua did as the down payment showing us that if you just get on the cross, then resurrection power comes. But resurrection is just the beginning. Because if you hold on, if you wait, if you don't quit, if you count your blessings in the middle of tribulation, in the middle of the hot sun, then when that day comes, when you go into Jerusalem and you're obedient and you follow and do Bible things in Bible ways and you trust by faith and you bring your sacrifice and you don't come empty-handed before God, then what's gonna happen is the Holy Spirit is going to come down. He is going to fill you with His Spirit. You know why? Not because you deserve it. It's because you took the time and had the patience to let the bread rise in you. You took the time to become mature. And so the Spirit of God is most strong on those who took the time, who went through something, who's got some stains on their dress. It ain't perfect. While everybody else is is, is looking at you and saying, look at him, look at her, look at all the mistakes that they made, look at this, look at that. God says, no, 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 that person has got ingredients for bread inside of them. That person's been through something. They've got the fire. They had time to rise. Things slowed down in their life. They repented. They they allowed themselves to become empty before me. There's no way for the Ruach, for the Spirit of the living God, to infuse and to breathe life into you like he did Adam till you empty yourself of yourself. And until we get to that place where we allow love to fill every crevice where people can't hurt you from their sin because all you do is see past them. I believe that some of you need to hear this message because you're holding on to pain. You're holding on to bitterness. You're holding on to what people did to you. And you're not seeing and holding on to what he did for you. 
And when you let it go, He will fill you. And when He fills you, you will become like a perfect clay in the Master's hand to mold you and make you to what you are called to be. Father Yahweh, we come before you and we thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you, God, that you take us from a place of leaven and you strip us of every prideful thing that we could ever have inside of us. And you bring us out of Egypt into a scary place. And Father, you open up waters for us and you move us across and we don't know what's happening around us. Things are crazy, the enemy's behind us. But when we come before your holy mountain and you speak, we become clean in just the spoken word. So Father, I pray for those out there today that are hurting, that are in pain, that have gone through something. I pray that they would see their something is everything that you need to make them mature and complete, not lacking anything. Raise us up on the third day, Father. Move us into maturity where love becomes what we're known for. Let the character and the ingredients of Christ flow through us in Yeshua's name, amen. Shalom, my friends. Until next time, I'm Jim Staley with Passion for Truth Ministries. Someone has donated to this ministry so that you could be blessed today. Would you consider paying it forward for others? If so, text pay it forward, all one word, to 801-801. That's pay it forward, no spaces, to 801-801. Or go to passionfortruth.com.